When you think of Judas Iscariot, what comes to mind? I'm sure many of you will think of him as a betrayer, someone with no loyalty, someone who is unfaithful. Well, I would like to say that Judas Iscariot wasn't always a traitor. Now, don't get me wrong, he betrayed Jesus, and he is known for being a traitor. However, he was not always a traitor. And I say this because scripture tells us that Judas was like you and me at one point. He was a man, a man who believed in Jesus at one point. In fact, he believed so much so that he was one of the 12 disciples. He was in Jesus's inner circle and within the inner circle of the 12 disciples. The Bible tells us John 12 verse six, that he kept the money back. Now, despite his lack of integrity, you have to acknowledge that at one point, Judas was trusted. Now, just because he was trusted, that does not mean he was trustworthy. There's a difference. So life lesson number one, not everyone who presents themselves to be trustworthy to you can be trusted. Here Judas was, a disciple of the Son of God the one they trusted with the money bag, their finances, but he was still a thief. John 12 verse six says, he did not say this because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. As keeper of the money bag, he used to help himself to what was put into it. Life lesson number two, how many of us follow Jesus? We have God first on our bio. We have the t-shirt that says, child of God. We're trusted in the church, but like Judas, we're stealing. You may not be stealing money like him, but perhaps you're stealing praise and worship that's meant for God. And instead of saying, praise God for this or that, you now have pride and you take the praise that's meant for God and say, I did that. That's all through my hard work. Judas Iscariot ticked the correct boxes concerning the faith walk. Maybe he did this better than you and me. This brings us to life lesson number three, which is, don't ever think that you can never be a Judas. 1 Corinthians 10 verse 12 says, so beware if you think it could never happen to you, lest your pride becomes your downfall. Saints, we need to climb down from our high moral ground and learn something because we will only be safe when we have the wisdom to know that as humans, though we may be saved, we are also vulnerable to backsliding and backstabbing Jesus Christ. Learn from the fall of Judas. Don't just judge him, but learn from him. Learn what not to do. That's wisdom. So Judas believed and followed Jesus like you and me. He was called like all the other apostles. Jesus gave the disciples, including Judas, the authority to heal sickness and disease and to drive demons out of those who were possessed. Matthew 10 verse one says, and when he had called his 12 disciples to him, he gave them power over unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal all kinds of sickness and kinds of disease. This means Judas was empowered like you and me with the authority to heal sickness and disease and to drive demons out of those who were possessed, all in the name of Jesus. As you read Matthew chapter 10, you'll find that Jesus sent out the 12 disciples with clear instructions. And in those 12 disciples, there was obviously Judas. So Judas was instructed to go preach the gospel to unbelievers, just like you and me. Judas was instructed to find the lost sheep, just like you and me. So Judas was instructed to do the work of God and heal the brokenhearted, just like you and me. Matthew 10 verse 7 says, And as you go, preach, saying, The kingdom of heaven is at hand meaning that Judas was instructed to preach and teach the arrival of the kingdom of God, the same message that you and I should be spreading. 
All of these instructions given to the disciples, including Judas, in Matthew 10, they all apply to us as modern-day Christians. We are to do God's work. We are to preach the gospel. We are empowered with authority through the name of Jesus. So it's now our choice to decide whether or not we choose to obey the word of God or if we walk in disobedience. Do we claim to follow Jesus but ignore the mission, the purpose or the calling that he has placed on our lives? We need to choose. Do we betray him and go the opposite direction to his will for us? Or do we stay the course and continue as faithful servants to the Lord? We all have choices and we all have to decide. Judas experienced so many things while walking with Jesus. He saw the miracles, he saw the signs and wonders, but yet he made the decision to go against God. Now we too can all testify about the goodness of God in our lives because at one point or another, God has done something for you. He has defended you. He has loved you. He has carried you through a tough situation, so we all have a testimony. So my question is, will you choose to continue following him? Will you choose to continue holding on to Jesus? Or like Judas, will you betray him? Will you betray him with sin? Will you betray him with idols in your heart? And I believe that one of the best ways to ensure that we are constantly choosing God first is to develop healthy habits. A habit of prayer, a habit of reading the word of God, a habit of spending quiet time with the Lord. The world talks about habits as if they're trivial, harmless, something we fall into by accident. But the truth is, habits can reveal important things about our lives. Our habits reflect our thoughts. Our habits reflect our priorities. Our habits reflect where our hearts are with God. How we spend our time reflects what we value, which reflects where we get our identity. At their core, habits are formed when you perform an action so often that it becomes a part of you. Of course, there are healthy habits and there are unhealthy habits. So what are some healthy habits that we as Christians should be practicing? First, we need to develop a habit of prayer. Coming to God in prayer might seem intimidating at first, but the more you do it, the more you realize that prayer is just a conversation with God. He wants us to come to Him with our thoughts and feelings. When you're in the middle of a trial, pray. When you're celebrating a great victory, pray. Prayer that starts as a habit becomes a lifestyle, and that can change your perspective on everything. Another important habit is reading the Word of God. The Bible is the most valuable resource we have here on earth. It's God's gift to us. It's the roadmap for our lives. And the more we read it, the more we soak up the truth. We start to see the world how God sees it. Our attitudes become more loving, more understanding, more compassionate. Finally, we should be in the habit of thankfulness. Instead of focusing on what we don't have, we can be grateful for what God has given us. Philippians 4.8 says, Whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Colossians 3.2 says, Set your minds on things that are above, 
not on things that are on earth. In a world full of negativity, making a habit of thankfulness is perhaps one of the best things we can do for our spiritual health. Our habits aren't just something we do. They aren't just another part of our daily routine. Our habits transform the way we live our lives. Unfortunately, it's not always easy to change our habits. So how can we go about this hard process? First, we need to hand it over to God. He will give us the strength to let go of our bad habits and the courage to take up new ones. And slowly but surely, those new habits will become like second nature to us. This takes faith. This takes patience. But the reward is great. One single step can change the trajectory of your life forever. So let God intervene in your life. Let him root out the unhealthy habits and replace them with ones that draw you closer to him. Let God change your habits and he will change your life.